Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tarek Masood. I'm a professor at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government and the faculty director of the Middle East Initiative, which is the organizer of tonight's event entitled Making Monotheism, Scholarly and Artistic Interpretations. I'm going to let our host for this evening, James Snyder, the executive chairman of the Jerusalem Foundation, introduce the event and his distinguished interlocutors but I wanted to take a moment to introduce James himself and to give you a sense of what he is up to and why we are so thrilled to have him as a senior fellow of the Middle East Initiative. James Snyder is an art historian who spent almost two decades as the director of the Israel Museum, which is this encyclopedic storehouse of knowledge that spans epochs and civilizations based in the ancient city of Jerusalem, a city of diverse cultures and religious traditions that we know primarily for its spectacular conflicts, but which for James is also a place of everyday cooperation and even comedy that is equally spectacular in its own way. In James's experience, much of the coexistence that he observed expressed itself around the city's shared artistic and architectural heritages. And this cemented his belief in the power of culture to bring us together, even as we acknowledge how it can also tear us apart. Tonight's event is the second in a series of conversations that James will be having with artists and scholars about art and culture and their role in shaping the Middle East with a particular focus on that narrow sliver of land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. These conversations are important to us at the Kennedy School because they bring into view dimensions of public life and public affairs to which we have frequently been inattentive, often to our peril. Artistic expressions have the potential, perhaps more than any other form of human endeavor, to shape who we are and how we understand ourselves. And if one of the great tests facing our world today is the persistence of cramped, mean, particularistic notions of who and what we are and what we're doing on this planet, then it's the work of creatives and artists that provide us with the greatest possibility of transcendence. Last month, we began this series of conversations with a conversation with James, in which we focused on his personal journey from the Monongahela Valley in Pennsylvania to Harvard, to New York, to Jerusalem, and the importance of place and rootedness to informing one's perspectives on life. Now today, James moves from place, from the earthly to the celestial, engaging a renowned scholar and a gifted performer in what I expect to be a fascinating discussion about the Middle East's most enduring contribution to world culture, the belief in a single, all-powerful God. It's the kind of conversation that only James Snyder can convene, and I trust you will believe that I'm not uh, indulging my penchant for exaggeration when I say that we are all in for an intellectual feast. And with that, let me turn this over now to our host for the evening, James Snyder. Thank you, Tarek. Thank you always for those great words. And every time that you speak, it reminds me of the first time that we met and how thrill thrilling it was for me to encounter someone coming from a kind of political world into what for me is an entirely cultural one and to begin together with you to see how those two worlds can resonate in a pretty amazing way. It, for me in the category of subjects that have a lot of meaning, monotheism is like a big subject. Some of you know me and you know that it is something that I think about a lot. I've thought a lot about its origins, about where it came from, how it presents itself in so many different ways. So. It's sort of thrilling for me to do an evening like this where we're going to bring together that subject, uh, looking at it from a scholarly perspective, from the perspective of interpretation in a scholarly way and also in a creative way, and to do it with two great figures who are actually perfect for this kind of conversation. And they happen to be also two great friends, Moshe Halbertal and Anthony Roth Costanzo, and I'll say a bit more about them in a few minutes. But first, by way of background, some of you who know me or who have come to earlier conversations in this series 
know that before I went to Jerusalem 20 some years ago, my entire life was focused on the invention of modernism. On 1850 and everything that happened then and thereafter that enabled the invention of the new language of modernism. I got to Jerusalem and I realized that if you lifted that carpet of modernism, there was quite a lot underneath. We went to Jerusalem in order to embrace first the Israel Museum, where as many of you know, you can see a million and a half years of material cultural history from that long ago to the present. And in the course of embracing and absorbing that history, I realized that we were looking at a long narrative that after a very long time led to the foundational creation of Judaism, then ultimately Christianity, thereafter Islam, and in the Israel Museum where we hold the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are the oldest uh, biblical texts, and where I started to invest a lot of energy in this subject. And I realized a long time ago that it's a subject that doesn't preoccupy just me, it preoccupies a lot of us. You might remember some of you that about 10 years ago, when at the Israel Museum, we uploaded the Dead Sea Scrolls in high resolution with Google, and in 48 hours, 2 million visitors from 212 countries signed up to look at those scrolls. So this isn't just an obsession of mine, it's an obsession for a great many. Also in the course of my years at the museum, I realized early on that it was a special opportunity to be able there really to embrace the archeology span of the ancient land and to see how that archeology span led from a very early history really to the Bible and to the Bible through archeology span as fact and then not as fiction, but rather as metaphor. So that there was a way to think about archeology span as the material narrative that also resonated in a parallel way with the evolving narrative of the Bible. So that's become a focus for me over a long period of time and it's really going to be our focus today. Part of the segue for today's conversation was also an exhibition that we did in the museum in 2016 called Pharaoh in Canaan, which was a very startling and revelatory story about a 500 year period during which Egypt ruled in Canaan. And it's a story that was shocking for many people. And again, it was a story where you were looking at two parallel narratives. One, a narrative of archeology, span and the other, of course, the metaphorical narrative of the Bible. That story and that exhibition began in around 1800 BC in a time of drought, the Canaanites migrated to the Egyptian Delta. Egypt was weak at that time. Those Canaanites grew into a culture of their own. Egypt strengthened again and pushed those Canaanites out of Egypt back into what would become the ancient land of Israel and Egypt ruled there for 500 years. What was the show about? The show was about material archeology. span It was about the kind of provincial archeology span that that culture produced against the backdrop of what we all know as the finesse of true classic Egyptian material culture from that same period. Of course, that long story was also a story of climate change and refugee migration, something that we all know about in our own time. So midstream in that story, Akhenaten was Pharaoh in Egypt. You all know that Akhenaten repudiated many gods, came to the notion of focusing on one force, that force would be the sun. And of course, that dispersed the notion of monotheism into the atmosphere around him and around culture in his time. After his fall, Egypt reverted to its brand of polytheism. The Canaanites migrated, and that, of course, became, that's the archaeological story that became the biblical narrative from Joseph to Moses, the story of the Exodus, the emergence of Judaic monotheism, the Bible, and later the unfolding of Christianity and Islam. So with that as a kind of context, our two guests for this evening are actually the perfect guests for this conversation. Moshe Halbertal is a great biblical scholar of foundational monotheism. He is a great scholar of Maimonides 
and of the story of adapting biblical Judaism to modern Jewish life, beginning in the 12th century and coming to our own time, and really being the foundational narrative of normative Judaism as we know it today. Anthony Roth Costanzo is a singer with really no background in any of what I've just described, except that when he was asked to take on the role of Akhenaten in the Philip Glass Opera, which he did at the Metropolitan this past year and also did previously in other productions, in order to take the role, he decided to embrace the role and immerse himself in a study of monotheism and its history in a way that would enable him to interpret Phyllis Glass's interpretation of, of Akhenaten. Now, I've described to you how I got to this subject, to this kind of quiet obsession with monotheism, and I want to begin by asking each of our speakers to speak to that as well. Moshe, how did this subject come to you, and why have you embraced it as your life's work? Well, uh, James, first, uh, really thanks for inviting me and Tarek as well for hosting all of us in this wonderful event and Anthony, it's wonderful to share it with you. Uh, you, you know, it's interesting. It starts from early childhood because in the synagogue, you recite something that you're going to recite till death. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. You know, that's the kind of Hebrew declaration of the faith in the unity of God, in the oneness of God. And uh, there is, a, in one way, um, some of my life, my inner spiritual and intellectual life, is trying to understand what, what do we mean by that? What does it mean? Uh, so, so... Um, what, what does it mean to think about oneness, unity, transcendence? Uh, are there very deep questions that define us as humans? Do we stand before God, the one God? Uh, what sort then, you know, being a student of, of Jewish thought and, uh, and philosophy in general, you understand the different interpretations and, um, and uh, aspects of it. Now it comes as well, and I, I will stop here. Uh, it comes as well with the concept of idolatry. I'm very interested in the in the opposite of monotheism or or the one god idolatry. Um, what is idolatry, and and does monotheism has this sh is a harsh edge of uh, of jealousy, of iconoclasm? Now, uh, I come to our life, I'm a Jerusalemite as well, you know, and uh, living in Jerusalem with our Islamic brethren. And Jerusalem is a, is a very complex city. You can say it's the overlapping maps of the sacred, you know, one, one on top of the other. And you ask yourself, here we are worshiping the same one God, right, at least. That's what we claim. Can we uh, can we transcend our our struggle? Can we reconcile around that gesture of worship, around standing before the one God? So it begins with very early memories, very early childhood memories of that declaration that defines you as, as a Jew. Goes through an interest, philosophical, religious interest in the concept coming to today's reality, where two monotheistic religions capturing the same space as theirs, trying to figure out whether they coexist in the same sacred space. So that's where I come from in, in terms of this question, but I'm sure we're going to have a lot of things to say about it as we go along. We are. Yes, and thank you. Anthony, tell us your story, which began much later. Well, thank you, James. And again, thank you to uh, Tarek. And it's an honor to be here with you, Moshe. So, you know, I come to this whole idea of monotheism and antiquity from uh, an artistic perspective. And through this lens of beauty and abstraction, I feel like I've been able to enter the subject in a way which illuminates it 
not only for me, but hopefully for the tens of thousands of people that we have made this performance for. But when I first started looking at Akhenaten and understanding who he was, and imagine if someone said to you, you're gonna play this historical figure, go find out who he is. And then you actually have to think about stepping onto a stage and being this person. But you're not being this person in a narrative opera, rather in a minimalist opera by Philip Glass, in which there's really no words. The, the words that are sung from in ancient Egyptian aren't understood by the audience. They're not translated for the audience. So with total abstraction, you have to communicate who this person was and what he was thinking. And so I went and I read a lot about him. And Akhenaten has become, I mean, one thing which is which is said a lot is that as extraordinary as his life was the interpretations of his life over the past millennia are equally extraordinary and the the this sort of fanaticism that he has inspired amongst different groups goes back to this idea that he is somehow the first individual as people refer to him in that he broke with hundreds and potentially thousands of years of thinking about religion and changed an entire society. And, and when we talk about his monotheism, just to, to go back to it, I would read these inscriptions that were written on, you know, in, in, on these ancient Egyptian artifacts, and they would say things like, the sun is the one God because the sun gives life to the cattle and the cattle gives life to humans, uh, or the sun gives life to the grass and the grass to the cattle and the cattle to humans. So he had all of these ways of thinking about it, but, but what really interested me is how did he arrive at this idea? And, and as I know we're going to approach soon, and, and I think you've alluded to this, Moshe, there's also this idea of being between man and God. And that is what the Pharaoh was. And Akhenaten tried in many ways to get closer to God. So I just want to say, and, and then I'll show you a little bit of, of how we got there. Um, but as I read, for example, all of the questions about Akhenaten's gender, was he a hermaphrodite, which is now an outdated word, we would say intersex. But for a long time, people said, you know, was was he both genders? We see breasts in, in these sculptures and we see big lips and hips. And I would go to Oxford and have Richard Parkinson, uh, an incredible Egyptologist, take me into the archives of the Ashmolean. And we'd look at Harold Carter's, uh, you know, uh, drawings of the statues as he saw them at the statues themselves. And I started to develop theories. And as James said, I, I come to this late and I am not a scholar in this. But I started to develop theories in a humanist way as the son of two psychologists, thinking about a, a, a man who saw the sun as the unification of man and woman. And he saw himself as somewhere between man and God. And therefore, he wanted to unify man and woman within himself. And so did he change himself? Did he somehow represent himself or have art represent him in a way that looked somehow between the genders? And it really tied into what I deal with as a countertenor, which is to say that I sing with what is generally considered a woman's register even though I sing it in a man's body. And so this idea that uh, Akhenaten was somehow uh, sort of coming through my interpretation or that I could find ways to think of, about that was very interesting. I want to show you this one minute trailer of, uh, of the production. And James, yes, sorry, you were going to say something. You no, know, before you show the trailer, each of you has said repeatedly, has used repeatedly the term interpretation and occasionally the term invention. And before you show the clip, I actually want to ask each of you to say a little bit more about this. In preparing for today, I thought a lot about the Bible on the one hand, and then Akhenaten on the other, but not Akhenaten as the figure, as, as the historical figure, but Akhenaten as the opera created by Philip Glass. And for me, the Bible, well, not for me, the Bible was an evolving oral narrative over a thousand and more years. It was invented or created, however you want to say it, but then really over a thousand years, it was interpreted 
because it was an oral narrative that then was documented. So from the time of Isaiah to the time of Maimonides and beyond, and Maimonides' writings in his time and for the thousand years since that time, this is an evolving interpretation. So that's on the one hand, and on the other, coming all the way to Akhenaten as opera, this was an invention of Philip Glass for the performative arts in the latter part of the 20th century, and then interpreted by you, Anthony, in your role. So Moshe, if you could first say a few words about this long evolution of the Bible as interpretation, and then Anthony, perhaps pick up on that with the invention of the opera and your interpretation. So, I mean, this is such a deep and rich question. So let's start with the relationship between the biblical tradition uh, responding to Akhenaten to a certain degree. Uh, and you have a, a figure, as, as Anthony described, who's come up with this idea that there is only, only maybe one God, it's the Son. And uh, it's repeated in the biblical tradition, but when you read the biblical tradition, actually it's very different. And here comes interpretation. Because in the biblical tradition, God would never be identified with the natural realm. Just take the, the very, you might say, the, the, the most important aspect of biblical time, the week. Now we, we live with, with, that, with that structure of time six days and the Sabbath. It doesn't have anything to do with any natural cycle. The day is a natural cycle, day and night, the month is a natural cycle, the year, but the week, that can come only with a culture, with a world, who doesn't think only about unity, but thinks about transcendence, in the sense that God transcends uh, the world. Uh, is not part of nature, is not the natural force, though uniting. And here is a very interesting moment in Psalms, I think, 104. Uh, um, it says, it says, Tashet choshech v'ilayla, meaning you have created the darkness, right? So, uh, because if, if, if Achnaton is, uh, you know, if the sun is God, then what do you do with night, right? And so the sun, the night is a, is a moment of receding of God, of disappearance of God, emerging, re-emerging, in a kind of almost resurrecting himself at the morning. But the, here you have a biblical take on it that says, no, no, God created both the sun, the, the sun and darkness, day and night. So you begin to, um, to see a moment in which you take a concept, one, right, which you feel here is a shared moment, a shared cultural moment, but you see when it's being internalized and completely being transformed through a great interpretive moment, right? Now that has, um, I mean, religiously speaking, humanly speaking, that has immense implications because it tells humans who are created in God's image that they can transcend the confines of causal nature, that there is something transcendent in them confronting God. I just want to end with someone, then we can talk about later interpretations of this same concept. Let's talk about the biblical, a, a, a biblical still, and I think that will be very different than the Egyptian background. The prohibition on image making, which is so deeply, I mean, in Islam as well, very deep, you cannot make any image of God, uh, which is the, the, the sense of God's transcendence cannot be captivated, cannot be trapped within a three-dimensional image. So uh, uh, we'll end up with God's name, right? Uh, God's name, Moses asks, what's your name? And he says, I'll be that I'll be, you know, he, he, you know, hey, hey, yeah. The, the one who will be. So uh, even he cannot be captivated by an embodied name. So here's a moment, right? And I think so much of our history 
cultural life is is in ways in which we inherent inherit and then reinterpret and transform uh, uh, and get into new insights about the world and us in the world and that was a moment the shift from the oneness of Akhnaton to the biblical one is both a moment of continuity and a great break or a great reinterpretation which will have far-reaching by the way also as well on art because at the moment uh, you know image making or of the gods is prohibited the whole the whole understanding of of art becomes uh, radically different so that will be just uh, by way of beginning to think about this uh, this um, ways in which cultures meet uh, uh, reinterpret transform in that moment of transform the transformation of the very idea of oneness of god in, in those two traditions moshe we're going to want to pick up on that evolving narrative which really also has to do with god in man god as man man as god but before that anthony come back to Philip Glass's invention of the opera and your interpretation of that narrative in that moment. So I think what Moshe is talking about also, which is really interesting to me, is when you have the idea, which is one thing, how do you then get people to buy it, to incorporate it into their lives? How does it become a part of culture? And in a sense, that's what Philip Glass's opera is about, but it is also because of Philip Glass's minimalism and his kind of uh, Buddhist underpinnings, it is in and of itself its own ritual, which is meant to both alienate you and then kind of hypnotize you. So within the three and a half hours of the opera, in a way you can, if you are in the right production and you're in the right mode, go on a journey where Akhenaten and the ideas of Akhenaten take you on board. So, um, you know, it, it is very, very repetitive. And after the first 10 minutes, you're in our production, which you're about to see a little video of, there's a, there's a scrim, a sort of front piece, and it slowly, slowly changes, but it's 10 minutes of almost the same chord, and you think that you're going to jump out of your skin if you have to sit through this whole thing. And as the opera goes on, all of a sudden, you want more of it. The, the act ends and, you, and everyone says, I couldn't believe it was already over. And then you get into this trance for three and a half hours. And I think that in a way, that was Philip Glass structuring his opera and using his tools to show us you know, what Akhenaten was able to accomplish in a very short amount of time. If you think of the Amarna period, it was 17 years. Uh, that he reigned, and he was able to put forth his way of operating. And of course, there was some force involved with changing an entire structure of society, how people wrote, um, how people made art. I mean, it was everything that had been changed. They united Upper and Lower Egypt, moved the kingdom. You know, it was a completely, a, a complete shift, but he did all of this in 17 years. And you see his rise and fall, through Philip Glass's music, but often with no telling, no direct narrative, linear telling of the story, often with just ah, or with this ancient Egyptian text. So it really falls to us as performers to tell it. And one thing I just leave you with to think about is, you know, was Akhenaten good or bad? And I thought about this a lot. You know, this is someone who destroyed temples that existed and he destroyed structures of priests being paid to make sacrifices by nobility and all of this. But he did it in the service of what he thought was this important uh, uh, progression for society to make. So was he in fact a, a dictator? You know, he stood on the balcony in the window of appearances as it was called and, and talked to people about his ideas in a way that the Nazis really looked up to. Or was he 
uh, a visionary who was ahead of his time and who the queer community or Thomas Mann or any number of, or Freud for that matter, write about as an icon who was really ahead of it. So in this, uh, is James, is this a good time to show the... Uh, it's the right time to show. Oh, so Some of us have seen this production, but I suspect many have not yet seen it. So I think it's quite important to see this moment. And what you're about to see is just one minute, and you will see that we used also the hypnotic rhythms of very artistic juggling. Uh, and you'll see a fantasy of Egyptian costumes, which are really Egypt seen through a lens of 1922 and Carter who discovered it. So this all exists in a kind of dreamland, but it comes together to give you a, a, a very distinct ritual. So here is a little trailer um, of Akhenaten. And the one other thing I, I want to say before I hand it back to you, James, is that, of course, the end of Akhenaten's life is a little bit of a mystery. Was he killed? Did he die of natural causes? What we do know is that every statue that was made of Akhenaten was destroyed when he, when he disappears. We've never found his you know, sarcophagus or tomb or any of those things. And in fact, the statues that were too large for them to destroy, they knocked the nose off because they believed that the soul existed in the nose. And so there was clearly an, an enormous amount of aggression and upheaval that he caused. And you see in the opera, um, his, his sort of birth as a pharaoh and his death as imagined by us really in the production, not so much Philip Glass who leaves it very open to interpretation. Um, and then you see him reappear as a kind of ghost in our times today. So um, that's, that's the trajectory of Akhenaten that I, I still continue to uh, uncover. Anthony, thank you. And you know, as I say, possibly some of us have seen this production, you really want to see this production, it is very hard to believe that for more than three hours, you experience a lot of what you just saw in that short clip. And, and when it's over, you wonder, has this been a kind of experience of transcendent meditation or meditative transcendence? But returning it to our subject, it really, in my mind, raises the question of what precipitates the evolution of religion? What precipitates the ongoing progression of theology? And a little bit, I think it's about troubling times. All of these moments in the unfolding of religious history and monotheistic history has to do with life in troubled times and trying to relate to and address the needs of people. And sometimes it comes out in the notion of God, as Moshe has been describing in a very articulate way, sometimes the notion of God in man, and sometimes the notion of man as God. And a lot of this has to do with, with metaphor and the way metaphor works in, in the unfolding of theology. I think it also sometimes has to do with politics. Anthony has just described that in the time of Akhenaten. And I, I, I want us to focus on that for a bit. For me, something that's always been quite moving is the way that Isaiah, or I guess Isaiah was more than one Isaiah, and Isaiah wrote first before the destruction of the first temple, then after. 
And in the course of Isaiah, he speaks of the notion of the spirit of the Lord is in me or the spirit of the Lord is on me. And hundreds of years later, in the gospel according to Luke, there is the story of Jesus entering the synagogue in Nazareth and reading Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is in me. And it's like in one moment, the same story morphs to foundational Christianity. And it was and is about serving the needs of the people. And the same, you know, as, as Anthony has already described regarding Akhenaten, in troubling times, he accomplished what he did. And his modus operandi was to try to ascend to embrace oneness with God. So I'd love us to talk about that a bit, Moshe. Well, so so you you're raising such a, a difficult question. What what propels a transformation? Right? What propels an insight? Um, and uh, some 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 of it has to do with crisis. Some of it actually has to do with spiritual crisis. Could be political. Could be spiritual. So let's let's talk about a, another stage, and then we're going to talk about man in God, God in man. Uh, you know, maybe the most powerful, strictest monotheist in the Jewish tradition, Maimonides. Uh, and so much of his world is shaped by encounter with Islam, with Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina and other great Islamic philosophers. And what, what does he do? And it's very interesting, apropos God in men. He says, you know, we all break images, you know, we, we, we the breaking of images, you, as, a, as a, the iconoclasm of, of the transcendent God. But what about the image in human, in the mind of a human? The internal, the mental image, right? Thinking about God in human terms, thinking about God anthropomorphically speaking, right? As is kind of a, just slightly bigger than me. And Maimonides says, you know, when you begin to anthropomorphize God, basically all religion is a form of self-worship, right? Because you worship humanity in a better shape. And he turns his, his iconoclastic zeal against the mental image, the cleansing of the mental image, which means, by the way, that you, can, you should fight not only visual plastic representations of God language itself because language creates the mental image and if you say the hand of God or you say God's wrath or other things you anthropomorphize God through language and at the end if you want to be a thorough monotheism monotheist at least with Maimonides you have to reach silence you have to reach silence because you understand that language as well is a limited medium for expressing the transcendent. And so Maimonides will say, for you silence is praise. That's a, a verse in Psalms. It's the ultimate form of worship. The ultimate form is that silence. So, uh, so we have this, uh, I would say, Ionispat, the rejection of God in men, or you may say humanizing God, through the mental icon. There is also another thing that, uh, that maybe, and that engages politics and the question of politics of men in God. Uh, because uh, within, within the Egyptian old world, uh, uh, the Pharaoh is a God, right? The leader precedes the nation is mythologized to be part of the very furniture of the cosmos. And it will be interesting that Anthony would maybe tell us more about that, whether in the mind of Akhenaton, he's a, he's a kind of an incarnation of God uh, or, 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 or not. Uh, what is his own self-understanding? Uh, and you have a whole tradition that rejects the very idea of deifying a human. De deification is the ultimate Sin is the is the crossing from the human to the divine. What happens to a human that that begins to feel or 
assumes that they are God, you know, the omnipotence of, uh, of the hubris of, of human power. Uh, and you see with, uh, you know, the counter tradition of, of the, the king in, in the Bible, in, in biblical religion, you know, the king uh, comes after the nation. He, the people ask for king in the book of Samuel, uh, you know, as, as an earthly being. The God is not the king and king, the king is not a God. So, uh, so we are, we are um, the, the question of, of, um, of politics, um, the, the way in which you want to break or put a boundary, you might say maybe, maybe monotheism is about a, a creating a, a, a kind of a impenetrable boundary between the human and the divine. Here, by the way, um, Islam and Christianity will have a complex relationship with, sorry, Islam and Judaism will have a complex relationship with Christianity and the concept of incarnation. So, uh, so yes, this is this is a whole um, um, a whole way in which um, um, theologies, religious sensibilities are shaped by crises, by spiritual uh, uh, quests, by political understandings of the relationship between politics and religion. Uh, uh, that will be a, a way maybe to enter your question. And actually, Moshe, I want to come back to this point about politics and this notion of men who make themselves gods or demagogues. But first, Anthony, say, speak a bit about Philip Glass's interpretation of exactly this conundrum. Well, interestingly, I don't think Philip Glass had an interpretation of this. <laughs> I think Philip Glass provided a context and a landscape as great composers and artists do, that enabled the performers themselves to find an interpretation and the director to, find, to, to shape it. So, you know, all great art is truly a collaboration and, and uh, an opera in particular is extremely interdisciplinary. But to sort of pick up on what Moshe was saying is, you know, who did Akhenaten himself feel vulnerable? What went through his head? And when the director said to me, the first time you enter the stage in uh, this opera, the first time people see you, what if you not only shaved your head, but what if you waxed your entire body and you entered completely naked? And in slow motion for six minutes, you are completely naked descending a staircase rather precariously in front of the audience. And what we did in a way was to show first how human, how extremely human and how vulnerable it is to be human. And then we saw piece by piece, the golden robes, the jewels, everything get piled on top of it. And this sense, we hope, that the human underneath that, that the vulnerability of being naked in front of 4,000 people is something which ties you to this protagonist. And did Akhenaten uh, in some way doubt his own convictions? How did he himself come to terms with it to create an entirely new, I mean, it, it is, if you imagine converting now to a different religion, well, it's a, a structure that exists, but when you are in fact converting an entire nation, and, and frankly, what followed in, in the hundreds of years, a, an entire world to a different way of approaching religion, what is it that you as a human being feel? And I think that that is, um, very interesting. It's a very complicated existential question as well. And maybe it is, as we talked about earlier, a kind of anthropomorph anthropomorphizing of something which is, in fact, just spiritual. But I think the reality that Akhenaten existed to the extent we know he did, he had to be torn uh, in many ways by these conflicts, you know, not least of which involve his union with Nefertiti and his uh, desire to put women and men on, on the same plane when they're represented in art and to show a loving family and the children that were a part of that and his drive to bring humanity and this sense of being a vulnerable human being into God rather than distancing himself 
from humans and putting himself on another plane, on another level in representation. So I think it's very interesting how he approached that. And of course, there's a lot of speculation we have to do because we only know so much. But again, I think the way that the music allows each audience member to uh, feel their own interpretation of, of what we give them uh, is, is further proof of that. Anthony, as the creative interpreter of the frame that Philip Glass provided for you, there is this incredibly climactic moment in the opera when Akhenaten ascends to embrace the oneness, to embrace oneness with the sun. There's a, there, there's a still image here with Anthony, which Anthony is showing. How did you feel presenting that moment? Well, it's really interesting you ask because the, the opera's in uh, several different languages, including ancient Egyptian and Aramaic, but this is the only moment in the opera in which there's an offstage chorus that sings in Hebrew. And so we have this sense that what Akhenaten is creating here somehow um, goes beyond for centuries. And, and I remember hearing that Hebrew chorus in this moment where I'm ascending this staircase very, very slowly. And in fact, the ritual of that that is a part of the ritual of performance that you do over and over again, that requires the coordination of hundreds of people at once, that felt like a, a religious experience, like a, a ritual. And the smell of the stage smoke, the feeling of that light on my face, the feeling of 4,000 eyes watching me very carefully ascend this staircase with no railing, very slowly in a long gown, which I could fall down at any point and you know, uh, create a disaster. The, the precariousness of that and all of those elements made it feel um, really like, a, uh, like a, a, a ritual, a religious ritual, a, a sacred ritual. Um, and I think that it ended with a unification with the sun and with light. Um, and that uh, was something that went both inside my body and beyond my body. And it is like, the last thing I'll say is it's like singing. You know, singing is ephemeral. The minute it happens, it's over. The minute sound emerges, it disappears. But it is also something in a very intimate way, which comes from inside my body and then enters through the ears and, and the air in the space, the body of everybody watching. And so in a sense, in that theater and in that space, the, the sound uh, I am penetrating with my ideas, with my intentions, with my voice, everyone else's body. And so that then becomes a, a, a very communal kind of ritual. You know what you just, you described a moment ago, the, the, the very important notion of embracing oneness, you know, this notion of embracing the sun, embracing oneness. It's not about being the one, it's about embracing oneness, which is a nice segue to return to Moshe's uh, brief reference to politics and the way that politics is a completely different story and the notion of men who portray themselves as gods, who are demagogues. I, I suppose Hitler is perhaps the best example of the last hundred years in that really challenging period in Europe between World War I and World War II, where he presented himself in that way, exploiting the needs of people, not serving the needs of people. Moshe, can you come back to that for a moment? I think it's I, I think it's not a it's not an accident that uh, when you read those early narratives in the book of Genesis, you know, uh, both the story of the the fallenness of Adam, uh, who wants to be a god, and then the Tower of Babylon, where they build this tower and they say Nasselan Hushem will be like God, is the ultimate sin of of a human. Uh, because the, with the ification, and you take the case of totalitarian form of the ification, becomes the quest for absolute domination. 
And uh, as Hannah Arendt beautifully described in her book, the, right, the origins of totalitarianism, one feature of the totalitarianism cannot accept is the human, because the human by definition is unpredictable, spontaneous and plural. And, uh, and totalitarianists, totalitarians who, who, who think they're God want humans that are completely predictable, unspontaneous and one. They want to make the many into one. And that's the root of the, the you might say, the ultimate, the radical evil of, uh, of, uh, of a human becoming a God. And I think part of the, the power of democratic and liberal sensibility is understanding deeply, deeply the finitude and the vulnerability of the leader. Rousseau says in one of his beautiful uh, uh, moments, he says, it took humanity a long time to accept an authority of some of a human who's not a god. Right? We, we, we have that, that, that vulnerability in ourselves. So yes, I, I think that uh, the deification, deification with its quest for, for uh, um, total domination is, uh, is, is, the, is the ultimate wrong that drives political structures. And you know, Moshe, you're bringing us to the last point that we want to cover before I think, Tarek, we perhaps have time for a few questions. Let's talk about today. We are exactly in another moment in time where we have climate change, world yeah. migration, and a pandemic. We know about this. This sort of uh, perfect storm of intersection has happened in the past. It's part of the unfolding of the theological narrative that we're talking about. And I guess my question for, for both of you, clearly there is a challenge here. I don't know if there is also an opportunity here, but how through interpretation, invention, and action, do we try to serve the needs of the people in a time as challenging as this? Uh, well, I can I can speak to my experience in the past four months. I, I've created a project with the New York Philharmonic where we have a basically a pickup truck and we go to every neighborhood throughout New York, every borough, and we play these 20 minute concerts. We call them pull up concerts uh, instead of pop up concerts. And um, I have seen firsthand. I mean, this is obviously not an audience who particularly knows about classical music, likes classical music. We don't announce these concerts, we just show up and there we are playing. And I've seen people break down and weep. I've seen them dance spontaneously. I've seen them, you know, and, and countless people have said to me, I needed this, I needed this. And it, it made me realize that music and art more generally is very powerful. And it's a very powerful tool to connect people, to, um, to change the perspective. We all get so immersed in what is very close to us and it is hard to, to have that perspective and, and music can do that. So I think that um, it was an opportunity for us to also register people to vote. It was an opportunity for us to talk about some of the events happening in our country and respond to them with abstraction of music, but that allowed people to project their own feelings into it. And so it serves in a way a similar purpose as, as religion often does, which is to provide reflection and provide beauty and provide a sense of ritual. And that I think um, in my experience has healed people, it's given them strength. And I think that on, as, a, as a starting point in today's world, we, we need that. I actually think this can be a very fertile time for art and culture and a very important time for art and culture to serve the needs of people. Moshe, in, in your view, from a different perspective, theological reflection can also serve in these times, yes? 
so there are two two things come to mind one is uh, one is the recognition of our utter vulnerability as uh, as humans you know and uh, anthony talked before about vulnerability i mean here we are you know just we we have a virus and and we're so vulnerable and not only that that our vulnerability paradoxically is expressed via our strength because we are so developed because there is we are global because we become more and more vulnerable in in some paradoxical ways and uh, we have to accept that vulnerability and we have to accept in relationship to the world and the relation between pandemic and the, and the environmental questions that we're facing the world is a gift not something we own uh, and that and that the sense and here i come with the second thought which i think what we are witnessing now in in politics is the loss of transcendence because when everything is politics even even death even masks even you know everything becomes politicized uh, there is a uh, there is the corruption of politics because, because politics needs some reference point outside itself. Uh, politics has to be in the surface of something higher than itself. And uh, we have to restore that sense of the sacred, of transcendence, that includes, by the way, the idea of truth. Because when you begin to undermine the very idea of fact, and you don't have any sense of truth, then everything is manipulated as a power game and that's that's something that that um, that you experience in the in our limited response to that vulnerable moment so the question is how we embrace vulnerability without being fatalistic on the one hand and on the other hand, how we restore a sense of transcendence, meaning how we, uh, how we, and I think if I look at leaders, if I look at leaders that we respect or admire, even if we did, don't agree with them, I think it's the sort of leaders that we knew about them, that there will be some realm that are not, that it's not they're not going to politicize it. There will be some issues that are not going to be used either to stay in power or to attack an opponent. They played the game of politics and that's fine, but there was some realm, the sacred realm. And I think what we have to do is to restore that sacred realm. So uh, theologically speaking, if you say, it's both about accepting vulnerability and restoring transcendence. In, in, a, in confronting that calamity. You know, thank you, Moshe. It's a great point. And you remember earlier, we referred to the kind of transcendent meditation that Anthony's depiction of Akhenaten inspires in our thinking. And these are great messages for us to try to get out in these difficult times. With that, I think we'll ask Tarek to conclude. Great. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Anthony and, and Moshe, for a really uh, rich conversation. We, I, I understand Anthony has to go, but I would be remiss if I didn't try to abuse my position and at least <laughs> ask one question of, of both of you. It's, they'll sound like different questions, but I think they're the same question. You know, Anthony, you were uh, in a, a, an opera that is... Uh, historicizing the emergence of this idea of one God. It's taking something that is very sacred to a lot of people and it's saying it could be invented by uh, man. And I'm just wondering if after any of your performances you encountered any members of the public who were troubled or angered or uh, otherwise uh, discombobulated by the central claim of the opera that in fact monotheism is something that was invented by a guy in my ancestral homeland of Egypt. I, I can't say that I was, I encountered that uh, because I, I think that again, we never 
put it forth in quite that straightforward a way. The telling of the story actually happens only through what you see, not through what we say. But I will tell you that I encountered a man in London who came up to me and a very large older gentleman in a suit with 10 men standing behind him. And he said, I have to talk to you. And I said, okay. And he said, um, you know, are you aware that you are showing us the Freemason sim sim symbolic uh, things in this opera? And I said, uh, I'm not. And he said, well, this is, these are all Freemasons. And um, we have seen the opera 10 times. And it, at the very end, you do this thing where you pass the ball from this person to this person and that person. And it is exactly what we do in Freemasonry. And of course, I remembered inventing that all myself in a rehearsal room. But I thought, what I realized is that it was more a template for people to imagine their own relationship uh, with religion, with themselves, with all of these things. And so, in fact, it didn't, um, it didn't so much presuppose a historical um, litany for how religion happened, but rather a kind of uh, blank canvas and with a lot of paint thrown on it that I think people, for whatever reason, were able to make their own, uh, you know, experience. Awesome. My, my question to Moshe is basically a, a, a similar version of that question. You know, when, uh, you know, I first learned about this opera from uh, uh, James, I got very excited because I thought, oh, this is Jan Osman's Moses the Egyptian wow. set to music. Wow. And I had always understood Osman's hypothesis, which is that monotheism is invented by Akhenaten, Moses's followers, um, later try to strip monotheism of any of its Egyptian uh, roots. I had always understood that as a as an hypothesis that was n maybe not generally accepted. What is your view of the hypothesis? I think it's a. I mean, Aslan's work is is fascinating, but I think it's it it might be blind to a certain nuance here that makes the whole difference. Because and that's when I said, you know, the one of Achnaton and the one of Moses are very different. Because no, uh, no biblical uh, thinker will ever dare or think of identifying God with the sun, with the sun, or any physical thing. Because it could be one. That's fine. Because the point of monotheism is not only oneness; it's transcendence, and and that's a, a deep transformation by the way, that has lots of political meaning because that means that, he, that, that the king cannot be a god, et cetera, et cetera. I said, you, you know, I said, let's begin with the idea of the Sabbath, the, the week. You, know, you cannot imagine it unless you strip yourself from the chains of the natural. So I, I you know, I, I, admire, I have a big respect and admiration for Asman, Asman's work, but, but here I think there is a very, very sharp, quantum leap in the understand in the religious understanding uh, that, that right now it is inspired but the, the, but transformed right what's key in monotheism is not the number of gods but the nature of god right you would say the following god is not and here the the hebrew and i would say even the arabic term uh, one also means unique right. and it's not only um, um, it's, you know, you get to a point with Maimonides and other theologians, we would say, you know, there, it's, it's such transcendent that you cannot apply the medium of language to grasp it because the language is the way we describe us and the world. So yes, the, the, the main thing is, is uniqueness, so uh, not only oneness. So I, I think it's, it's my job now to bring us to a close. The only thing I can say is that this was probably the most intellectually exciting 70 minutes I have spent in my 12 years on the faculty at Harvard. And for that, we have to thank Anthony Roth Costanzo and Moshe Halbertal, and most of all, James Snyder for convening this.
thank you all for joining us. James, any last words before we close? Well, really, really just to thank you for giving us the opportunity and for believing that this conversation could, could be as rich as it became. And really to thank Moshe and Anthony for participating and for these great words. These are challenging times and conversations like this can be uplifting for us. So they are deeply appreciated. And we'll have another conversation next month uh, around a similar theme. And so people should look out for that as well. Thank you all and have a good rest of your evenings. Bye-bye.